Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting a crazy Belgian. <laughs> I speak Dutch English, so I hope everybody will understand me today. If not, just raise your hand and I'll hand you over to Annalise then who will <laughs> translate what I'm saying. Now, um, the reason that I'm standing here is an experience I got a couple of years ago, and I wonder how many of you have had the same experience. Um, you know, maybe the experience that you're doing your job as a caretaker, as a teacher, as a parent, because that's also a job, quite well if you take the official guidelines, you're working according to the book, to the manual, so, technically seeing what you're doing is right, but yet it doesn't feel right. Who has had that experience? That, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm supposed to do this, because professionals tell me to do so, manuals say so, and yet it doesn't feel like. You know the feeling? Well, I got that feeling a couple of years ago. Um, and maybe I have to clarify a little bit more about myself so you can see the context of the feeling. Um, because. Um, not many of you have heard me speak, indeed, uh, but I think most of you have social skills enough to, if they would be interested in knowing more about me, to ask it slightly different than the boy with autism in a school in Sweden who asked his teacher when he saw me, who's that little old, ugly, grey-haired man over there? <laughs> um, now, I work for Autism Central, indeed. Um, where we try to translate um, evidence-based things and scientific knowledge into very practical strategies for parents, professionals, and also for people with autism themselves. And my experience uh, is concerning one of the workshops I've been giving quite a lot of times. You know, um, since more than five years, I do this workshop at Autism Central called Autism and Stress Management. It's one of the most successful workshops we have. It's always fully booked. A lot of parents, teachers come. Um, and the goal is in two days, it's a two-day workshop, that people go home or back to their work with, indeed, a stress management plan. Now, one of the things that I do the first day is to ask staff members, caretakers, teachers, parents, what exactly causes stress in the person with autism. And for that reason, I developed a stress questionnaire over the years, which has been highly successful, has been copied many, many times. But you know what? My experience was always when I spent the whole day asking caretakers, teachers, parents to fill in the questionnaire, that by the end of the day, we were all depressed. <laughs> because I asked them, okay, any sensory experiences that cause stress? Oh yes, and they ticked the boxes. And he's social, oh yes, and they tick the box, and by the end of the day, oh Jesus, is it that bad? And that, that, you know, that's the experience that I got, well, technically seen, this is right, because stress is a very important area, isn't it? So we should do work on stress, but we don't feel very happy at the end of the day doing this work, so it didn't feel right. And then I said, what if we would make a U-turn here? What instead, if, instead of asking people what causes stress, what if I would change my questionnaire into a questionnaire assessing what gives them a good feeling? And that's the background of my story today. In this keynote, I will give you the great outlines of why we should work on happiness and emotional well-being. In the workshop, I will talk more about the strategies, how to do that. So first, I'll give you the reason. Okay, now... Um, if researchers want to find out how people with autism do in life, what the so-called outcome is of autism on the long term, what becomes of people with autism, then they do scientific research. And we're now more than 60 years after Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, there has been done a lot of these outcome studies. And if you really want to have a, a kind of a summary of all the results, what we know of what becomes of autism in adult life, there's even studies of the studies. And those studies are called the review studies. And here's one, a quite recent one that I can recommend. Um, okay, now what do we know about the results of autism 
in adult life, we know that it's highly variable, which means there are people with autism who fare pretty well in life, who do quite well, and researchers, um, they, they then speak of a good outcome. Some do fairly well, that's a fair outcome, some do poorly, and that's a poor outcome. Um, now, we do know that a couple of um, variables uh, are quite predictive, such as IQ and uh, the presence of spoken language at the age of six, but for the rest, we are actually, right now, unable to predict the future. You know, I did home training for many years. I diagnosed children, uh, often when they were three to four years old, and then parents asked me, well, what will become of him? And I made the mistake in the old days of giving some predictions, saying, well, your child seems to be very smart. I think it will be okay. Some of these so-called smart kids are not okay now as an adult, and the other way around. I remember a boy, at the age of four, he could not talk, he could not even walk. He was still crawling. And now he's one of the experts in Belgium on meteorology and astronomics. You see, so it's difficult to say. But what we do know is that the diagnosis, if it's, of course, a reliable diagnosis, is quite stable. Um, and that autism symptoms um, decrease and adaptive skills often improve, at least when children with autism get the chance to meet the right teachers and the right support to develop the skills they have. But the outcome is way more positive than we thought 20 years ago it was. However, if we look at how they really manage in society and how much they contribute to our society, how, how well they are integrated um, in the social tissue of our society and how independent they are, then we're speaking now even now, 2014, with all the resources and all the special education and all the treatment we have, still have a poor outcome for at least half of the population, which should make you a little bit depressed by now. <laughs> this is not very positive. But let's look into the criteria that these researchers use. If you look into the outcome studies, of course, they don't just sit there, research, and say, OK, what's this? Is this a good outcome? Hmm? They use criteria to measure. It's science, you know. They want to measure. They want to have some graphs and some tables and some statistics. So they use criteria. And what are the criteria they use? Here are the most commonly used criteria to define whether the outcome of a person with autism is good, <coughs> fair, bad. Or... They look whether people have a job or not. Okay? Well, employment. They look into the number of friends and relationships. Does this person have friends or not? They look into health conditions, especially mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. um, they measure the cognitive functioning because that's what many of these ABA therapies promise, that the IQ will increase. Mm -hmm. So they measure IQ and cognitive functioning, not only IQ but on other uh, tests as well. They, they look at the living situation. Is this person living on his own independently or does he still live with his parents? Or does she live in a group home? And then they kind of measure the autism symptoms. We now have a lot of questionnaires measuring autism symptoms. Now, these are the criteria that have been used. And of course, they do make sense. Because if, as a 40-year-old, you still live with your parents, well, in society, we don't consider that as, let's say, a high level of functioning, don't we? We say, well, you're supposed, as a grown-up, to take care of yourself. They should be able to live independently. So many of these criteria, they reflect what I would call societal norms, which means those things that we consider in society as important criteria to assess the outcome, how you're doing. But it doesn't say a lot about personal goals. And it certainly does not say a lot about subjective experiences. And let me illustrate that with two case examples. Um, look, on the left you see Peter. Um, and Peter is a grown-up with autism. He has a near normal IQ. Um, he lives in a group home in Belgium. So living in a group home, if you take the criteria of science, that's not considered to be a good outcome. Hmm? That makes the outcome worse. Hmm? He lives in a group home. 
he's unable to take care of himself, which means he needs support in getting dressed in the morning. Can't do that on his own. He needs support for getting his food because he can't cook independently. So he's depending on other people cooking a meal for him. He's dependent on professionals for almost everything in his life. You see Peter here while doing a music activity in his group home because Peter loves music and he's not the only one. There's a couple of guys in that group room who really love music. So what the staff does, almost every day there's an activity with music. Peter also loves to swim. So they take him out to the swimming pool at least three times a week. He adores it. Peter doesn't have any friends. But he calls all the staff members his friends. Because he likes them. And he likes what they do with him. Okay, this is Peter. On the right, you don't see Mark, but his apartment. Maybe some people recognize situations here. <laughs> Mark is a um, so-called high-functioning person with autism. Lives independently. Has his own apartment. Hmm? Has a job. Well, a job he hates because he has a university degree in law, but he does some, let's say, very simple basic tasks at an office. Hmm? Doing the post, uh, sorting papers, doing some copying work. Work that he hates because he thinks that it's below his level. He has a university degree. Uh, Mark has friends, quite a lot of them, on the internet. Hmm? He plays World of Warcraft during the night, often gets too late at the office because he doesn't get up in the morning. Hmm? But the friends he has are all people he knows from World of Warcraft. He's one of the avatars that gives advice, so he has quite a high status there. Hmm? Um, he can cook, but he never does it. He buys, as you can see, junk food every day the same. Drinks a lot of Coca-Cola. Yeah? Does not exercise. His room is full, as you can see. So he had some friends who came to his apartment, but they gave up coming because there's not even a chair to sit on. And it smells very badly because he never cleans up. He was very talented in music because you see over there, but he doesn't do it anymore because we can't get it organized. Okay, now, if I was a scientist and I measured the outcome of these two guys with my official criteria, the result would be that Peter has a very poor outcome. Very depending on other people. Hmm? Not being able to be independent in any area. And Mark would have a very high outcome. He has a job, lives on his own, has friends. Now I ask you, if you were obliged to trade places, who would you like to be? Peter or Mark? I think I would be prefer to be Peter. Okay, he's not the most high-functioning guy here, but he's having a happy life. Hmm? And that's what we forget. What we have forgotten until now when we do research in autism, when we measure outcomes, we measure levels of functioning, high-functioning, low-functioning. I hate the terms for that reason. It's not because you're high-functioning that you're highly happy. Hmm? I will come back to that in my strategies this afternoon. So objective criteria might be useful, but they don't say much about quality of life. Hmm? Um, you know what? If, if we would take other criteria, maybe the whole picture we have right now about autism being a very severe condition or disorder would be quite different. And that's what, what people in Sweden did. This research group around um, Christopher Gilberg, you see in the middle, what they did a couple of years ago, or 10 years ago, they did also a population-based outcome study. They call it follow-up study because they follow up the same group of guys. Of 120, and they used the traditional criteria for measuring outcome. And as you can see, for the majority, almost 80% of the people with autism or atypical autism, those were the names we used in those days, eh, the outcome was very poor or poor. Hmm? Um, and that's just an example of one of the many studies that, that has been done in the last 20 years. Many of them come with the result of autism has a poor or very poor outcome. But what they did, and this is the, the nice thing about it, 
They did the whole research again, five years later, but this time, instead of measuring the outcome with the traditional criteria, such as having a job, being independent, they looked into quality of life. They asked parents and, and caretakers and staff to measure the quality of life of these adults, of whom many were so-called low-functioning, because except for four, as you saw on the former slide, except for four, all of them lived in a group home, so they were actually not independent at all. They did the same research again, but this time they assessed quality of life. They asked how happy they were. They asked for well-being, and the results are completely different because the same group where almost 80% had a very poor or poor outcome, if we follow the traditional criteria, if they were being assessed on their well-being, 91% had a high or very high level of residential well-being. So you see, that's the same group, but this is a more positive thing, isn't it? Hmm? That, so that does mean, I will come back to that in my workshop, that we maybe should stop aiming at higher levels of functioning, hmm? but higher levels of well-being. Hmm? Okay, now, um, of course, recently scientists have discovered this thing called well-being. Um, so <laughs> they start doing research on it. Hmm? And... Um, one of the studies I want to show, and, and, and it shows us that there's still a lot of work for us to do when it concerns well-being, is this uh, study done in, in the Netherlands, um, where they asked a group of so-called high-functioning adults with autism, but also other ad adults with other psychiatric disorders, such as uh, ADHD, eh? um, they asked them to rate their own quality of life. Hmm? Um, now, just to show you the group they um, studied, 12% um, of them were in an intimate relationship, which is a quite high number if you compare it to most studies. Hmm? Of course, still eight, almost 90% was not in an intimate relationship, but 12% is quite high. Hmm? It's kind of the, what you would expect nowadays. Hmm? Uh, if you look at the living situation, only one out of five of these adults lived in a group home. 45% still live with their parents, and I think that's one of the challenges for the nearby future. All these young adults still living with their parents. Um, but 27% lived independently, and 7% lived with their partners. So more than one out of three had this so-called high level of outcome when it comes to their living situation. Um, almost half of them had a job which is quite high number. It's an extreme high number if you compare it to other studies. And what about their mental health conditions? Six out of ten had never been in mental health care for mental health issues, not in the past, not now. Okay, taken together, if you use, again, the objective criteria for outcome in autism, this is what we would call a very high-functioning group, isn't it? And these are the results when it comes to quality of life. Except for their physical condition, the people with autism uh, rated themselves as being healthier than the control group. Mm -hmm. But for all the other areas, such as are you satisfied with your current living arrangements? Are you satisfied with your current job? With your current education? Are you satisfied with your current social relationships? What are your ideas about your future, your own personal perspective? The group with autism scored worse, less well than the control group. And the control group were people with other childhood psychiatric disorders. So it's not that we compare apples and pears here. We're comparing apples with other kinds of apples. Right? Um, wow. So that means try to stop looking only at the official criteria for an outcome. It's not because somebody has a job that they are happy in life. And I see many people now look at me, oh yes, yes. <laughs> You know, when we talk about well-being, then the whole thing about autism becomes less relevant because well-being is something that is, we all seek. We are all seeking well-being, aren't we? So then people with autism are not different from people without autism. Okay, what is this quality of life? Um, there are very smart people, smarter than I am, who have done a lot of work on, on defining what quality of life is. One of the most well-known um, 
person in, in this area is uh, Robert Shallock, who defined uh, quality of life as three big areas. One is indeed the independence. Eh? Uh, the other one is uh, social participation. How uh, well is your social inclusion? What about your rights? But I will focus on the last area, the well-being, um, which again has three areas, namely the physical well-being, the material well-being, and the emotional well-being. You know, it's all about being healthy, hmm, being rich, and being happy. Hmm? Um, so, these three are interrelated. I will focus on happiness and emotional well-being, but of course, you can't, theoretically, we, we can make a distinction between the three, but they influence each other. To start with um, this good income, hmm? uh, we all know that money doesn't buy happiness, but I'd rather cry in my Ferrari than on my bicycle. <laughs> so having a good income makes it possible for you to afford the things that give, increase your quality of life. Okay, you can say, I love this. Ladies, who of you loves a good massage? You know these wellness? They're bloody expensive, aren't they? <laughs> okay, so if you don't have any money, you can dream of the massage and the well-being, but you can't afford it. Hmm? So therefore, I will come back to that in my strategies. One of the, the bold things I'm going to say today, I'm going to say many more bold things, is every person with autism should have a job. Hmm? Uh, and one of the reasons is it gives you an income. Now, what about health? Um, that's something that is easily overlooked because when it's all about well-being, most people have the tendency to focus only on the upper 10 centimeters of the person's body, meaning the mind. Well, you know, eating healthy food, having enough sleep and a good quality of sleep, exercising can make you feel better as well. Um, we already know that, hmm? but most people, when, when people tell you, I'm not feeling well, then you have, suddenly have to go to a psychologist who talks and talks and talks. Well, you could just be lying down, that's also fun to do. Um, and we all know that, that the people in Rome already knew it, this famous Latin sentence, you all speak Latin, do you, in Birmingham? <laughs> Mens sana in corpore sano means? A healthy mind and a healthy body. So, um, I will not talk too much about that, uh, because I'm, I'm not a good example myself. If you look at me, my six-pack is no longer a six-pack anymore. Um, but I, I do know that um, it, when people with autism don't feel well, one of the first things you should do is to, to put more exercise in their program. I know many of them hate it, I know that. But it's something you have to do in order to learn to appreciate it. Uh, one of the remarkable things in, in Denmark, many, many years ago, the Danish government decided to oblige one hour of physical exercise for all schools and group homes in Denmark. Now, there was this uh, school and group homes called Sophie Skolen. One of the pioneers in autism schools and group homes in Denmark, run by uh, the late Dimitrios Harakopos, and they thought, oh, geez, what do we have to do with all those so-called low, very low-functioning adults with autism? Now we're obliged from the authorities to do exercise one hour a day. Can't do any highly sophisticated group activities with them. So all they could do is go and run, jogging, running. They did that for one hour a day. Remarkably, after three months, the number of challenging behaviors decreased with 30%. And they had done nothing else than taking them out into the woods one hour a day. So we all know that, hmm, that sport is very efficient, works even better than the combination of Prozac and psychotherapy. So start running with them. Um, of course, make sure that you know where they run to and that they <laughs> come back. <laughs> okay, let's focus on happiness. Uh, what is it? Well, the, 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 the thing is about happiness is that most people, and, and that is kind of interfering with us thinking about good strategies to promote well-being, that most people have this picture of happiness. That's what most people think what it is. Having your tequila on a sunny beach somewhere in Hawaii or the Seychelles whatsoever. While for most of us, happiness is more like this. Okay. <laughs> 
having your beer on your fat belly watching football on telly. Hmm? So well, I think it is very important because why I'm saying this, because too often what I see is that uh, the non-autistic environment of people with autism put up standards for people with autism that are way higher than the standards we use for ourselves. For instance, stop me when I talk too much about this because this is one of my obsessive topics. The same is true for social skills training. Often I see that children and youngsters with autism need to meet higher standards for social skills than we apply to ourselves. Are you always that polite? <laughs> Are you always that empathetic? No, you're not. So the same with happiness. I'm not talking about, you know, the big things about happiness. For me, it's, it's, I'm from Belgium, I have a simple mind, it's quite simple. It's all about the balance between negative feelings and positive feelings. And if they are in balance, then we can say, okay, there's life satisfaction. Hmm? Because, let's be honest, life is shit. <laughs> it's impossible to be, you know, happy all day long. Eh? <laughs> the happiness that you see in the ads, the happiness that you see on telly, let's be honest, is that your life? You wake up every morning, yeah, let's. <laughs> there's no kids ruining your morning routine. Kids that won't go to school. No, everybody. And you come, at, you come at the office at your work and everybody, hey, we're hugging each other all the day. No. Hmm? So if, this is a if there's a balance between positive and negative feelings, then I say, okay, be satisfied because that's life satisfaction. There's little life satisfaction when you have more negative emotions than positive ones. And you're very unhappy when most of the time you're experiencing negative feelings or they are way stronger than the positive feelings or they take longer than the positive feelings. Then we say, okay, you're very unhappy. And when you have this for too long time, you start developing all kinds of mental health problems. Things that we all know, we call it stress, we call it anxiety, we call it depression. Hmm? And we do know, indeed, that in autism there's a lot of um, mental health um, issues. Hmm? I, I still use the word problems. I hope you excuse me. I'm not into political correct language. Hmm? Um, I, I love the word problems, by the way. I love it. Oh, geez, that's such a nice word, isn't it? Because if I hear about a problem, then it tells me, okay, Peter, find a solution. When it's an issue, I don't know what to do. <laughs> What do you do with an issue? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Lifetime prevalence is quite high for depression and anxiety disorder. However, if you have autism, the lifetime prevalence is way higher. Hmm? This is, is a kind of a summary of all the research done on mental health problems in autism. And we do know that there's an increased uh, rate of anxiety problems and depression in autism. And that's why many researchers and many professionals focus on all these negative things and they develop, just as I did, I developed a stress questionnaire and I'm not the only person who developed a stress questionnaire. There's other people who have done the same thing. There's people who, who try to figure out how to measure anxiety problems in people with autism, how to measure depression, and we have a lot of questionnaires for those things. But you know what? As I said, my experience is that it only makes us more depressed ourselves. And you know what? The, late, the last thing you need as a person with autism when you have mental health problems is a professional who's depressed themselves. <laughs> huh? So if you ask me why should we focus on mental health, uh, on well-being and happiness, because I want the professionals and the parents to be happy. Because as a child, you're better off with a happy parent than with a depressed parent. So do it for yourself, not for them, because then you will be a better professional. Okay, let's make the U-turn. And that means our goal should not be having the balance. Our goal should be that you will experience more difficulties, have uh, more a hard time. So if we only aim at the balance and something bad happens, then again we have more negative feelings than positive feelings. So the first reason is, if we can give people with autism a lot more positive feelings than negative feelings, and then something bad happens, and something bad will happen sooner or later, because it happens to us as well, 
then there will still be imbalance and not out of balance in the direction of the mental health issues. You know what? This is my very simple visual way of showing this. I can also use more complicated words. Working on positive feelings increases your resilience. So it makes people more resilient. That's the other way to name this. And the second thing is, is that it, it, you know, when I did this stress questionnaire, it, it was like I ended up together with the parents and the professionals in a kind of a vicious circle. The more we looked into negative things, the more negative we got ourselves, the more depressed we were, the more depressed we were, the more hopeless we were to start changing things. So we got into this vicious circle. Now researchers have discovered that what, what is called a vicious circle, when it concerns negative issues, when you turn it around, you get a virtu virtuous circle. So it means the more you work on positive things, the more happy people will be, the more happy they are, the more creative they will be to think of strategies to improve well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, we do know that there is a link between negative feelings and, and getting stuck in your thinking, being rigid in your thinking, um, focusing too much and too, for too long time on irrelevant details. And on the other hand, positive feelings increase your flexibility, your cognitive functioning. Now, that is not only true for you as parents or professionals, but that's also true for the people with autism. Hey, wait a minute, I know these things. Detail, focus, rigidity and thinking, where do you know that from? Come on, doesn't it ring a bell? That's autism, isn't it? Oh, but what this research is showing us is if we could give people with autism more positive feelings, it will make them more flexible in their thinking and less detailed focused. In other words, it will make them less autistic. That's something to think about. Because usually, we think the other way around. We think, okay, let's work on the autism problems, uh, sorry, issues. Hmm? Let's work on the social skills, let's work on communication, and the less autistic they are, the higher they will be functioning, the more well-being there will be. Well, I think this is wrong of us. We should stop thinking this. Maybe it works like this. Increase the well-being and they will be more flexible, they will be more open. Come on, how social are you when you are not feeling well? What's the level of your social skills when you're depressed? I don't think a very high level of social skills. What if I would say that, then you need to go into social skills training, you know? Now, wouldn't make sense, would it? I think you would say, no, no, get me out of my depression and I can perform better. Why do we focus on the social skills with people with autism instead of first making them feel better? That's what I often see. People with autism who are more relaxed often show more social skills than when they are stressed. And that's, again, human. One of the things we do in Belgium, we give them a beer. <laughs> one of our good, strong Belgian beers, and suddenly we see a lot of social skills. <laughs> Not all the social skills we want to see, but okay. <laughs> now, okay, um, these are the four strategies that I will describe in my workshop later on this morning. Um, I won't um, talk about them now in detail, um, but um, I'm going to talk about something else that is kind of necessary before you start working on these strategies. And that's the following thing. To me, nowadays, it looks as if we've landed into some supermarket of treatments for wellness, also for people with autism, um, including the mindfulness that Annalise will talk about. Um, now, I'm not saying that all these things are wrong. On the contrary, um, uh, I think uh, Annalise convinced me with her work that mindfulness can be very, very useful for people with autism. And maybe psychotherapy as well, and relaxation as well, and cognitive behavior therapy as well. That's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is this one. Often, when uh, people with autism do not feel well, when there's not enough well-being and happiness, I see professionals stacking up one specialized treatment method after another. Okay, meditation, we've done that, but it didn't work enough. Let's do some CBT as well. Oh, yeah, CBT worked a little bit, but maybe he would be helped with a little bit of yoga. 
Huh? Um, yeah, and what about, let's try some neurofeedback as well. Huh? You know, never bet, never bet on one horse. That's the idea about it. Huh? Now, that's okay. The trouble is, you can stack up as many specialized treatments for wellness and well-being and happiness if there's not a found, uh, sound foundation, this is what will happen. It won't work. It won't work. So the first thing is to make sure there's a solid foundation where on top of the solid foundation you build the more specialized strategies. Okay. Now, um, this is the solid foundation is what I call autism friendliness. If you want to increase happiness and well-being in people with autism, I will describe four strategies, but the very first strategy you have to think of is autism friendliness. And why is that so? Because first of all, often we overlook those things that are quite obvious and that are the first need. And this is all according um, to this principle that is known Occam, Occam's razor, uh, which says, don't make it too complicated. Eh? Um, named after um, a philosopher, a mathematician of the 14th century. And the whole idea of Occam is the following one. Um, if you hear hoofs, think of horses and not of zebras. You know the idea? Don't make it too complicated. Think of those things that are the most obvious one. If you hear hoof, then probably, certainly here in Birmingham, it won't be a zebra. Hmm? <laughs> um, now, translated to, to uh, healthcare, to mental healthcare, it means if someone is complaining from a headache, don't tell them, okay, then you need sophisticated <coughs> neurosurgery. <laughs> Start with an aspirin. You know, that's what we call in Belgium and in the Netherlands, we call that common sense. You do those things that are common sense. Now, when it comes to autism, you know, I think sometimes we have lost our common sense. We jump from one sophisticated therapy to another one. By the way, this neurofeedback, would that help as well? And even this morning, on the internet, you know, elephant therapy. I'm not kidding. What's wrong with the dolphins then? <laughs> Probably they're not cured yet, the dolphins. That's what I answer. What do you think of dolphin therapy? I think I haven't met a dolphin who got any better of it. <laughs> we, we make it complicated and all kinds of new methods and therapies. You know what? I'll give an example. I, I, I came into this group home and they asked me, Peter, um, do you have any books you can recommend or treatment strategies for people with autism who also have anorexia? I said, wait, wait a minute. Anorexia? Yeah, because we have this young man here and he's autistic and he also suffers from anorexia. I said, why does he suffer from anorexia? Because I do know anorexia can occur in men, but it's quite seldom, isn't it? I said, well, why do you think he has anorexia? Well, he only eats fruit for the moment. And he refuses all the rest. So he lost a lot of weight. Hmm? Okay, losing weight is an indication for anorexia. Um, but I think, pff, when did it happen? Because anorexia, did it happen suddenly or did he grow into it? And I said, yeah, it all started with his grandfather who died from cancer. And a week later, he saw a television program about uh, cancer, and there they said that uh, fat increases your risk for cancer. Since then, he has checked all the products we have here. The cheese, the bread, and you know nowadays it's obliged to put all the ingredients. Try to find something that does not contain any fat. With his autistic mind, he took it quite literally. No fat, because otherwise I get cancer and I die just as my grandfather. And the only thing that were left that had no fat were vegetables and fruit. He hated vegetables, as many of them do. So all that was left was fruit. Does he need a special treatment for anorexia? I don't think so, because treatment for anorexia, for those who know about it, is all about starting with what's your self-esteem? What do you think of your own body? 
What do you think a normal body size is? So it's all about kind of psychotherapy on self-esteem because that's the reason for girls to develop anorexia. It's not about reading how much after, after a while they do that, of course. So what this man needed was not a special treatment for anorexia adapted to autism. What he needed was a good old-fashioned autism-friendly explanation about fat and cancer. What I call pushing the context button. No specialized treatments needed. You see, that's, that's what often happens. Okay, so. Five minutes, Peter. What, what is five minutes? The that's end. about 300 seconds. <laughs> Thank you for informing me. Now I know what five minutes is in Birmingham. Thank you very much, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> My teacher, Ina van Berkelaar, she's a professor in the Netherlands, also the teacher of Annelise, by the way, our professor. She once said, you know, you can, uh, in an autism treatment protocol, I divide three layers. And the basic layer is make sure that a person with autism is experiencing a climate, a living and learning climate, that is adapted to the autistic thinking. And that's the basic. If you don't do that, anything else on top of that doesn't make sense. So all the specific treatments for well-being, um, they, they do make sense, but they won't work if the basic layer is not there. And the basic layer is all about creating an autism-friendly environment. And that means an environment adapted to the autistic style of information processing. Hmm? Um, we, we use a lot this, this uh, autism-friendliness. I think the, the term is here well-known as well. Why is this so important for well-being? Well, if you look at emotional well-being, this, this guy, Shalok, he described also several elements that belong to emotional well-being, such as spirituality, meaningfulness in life, which you also have in the PERMA model of Seligman, and there you have meaningfulness as well, uh, positive self-esteem, contentment, but there's two areas that are very basic to all of us, and that's freedom from stress and safety. If you don't feel safe, well, you won't be very content, you won't have experienced a lot of meaningful in your life. And what creates safety and freedom from stress? The autism friendliness. And in our definition, autism friendliness is not the normal friendliness. It's all about 90% clarity and 10% the normal friendliness. To give you one example, too often by being friendly, you're being autism unfriendly because you're not clear enough. Do you want to help me with this? You ask a student and the student says, no. Come on, help me. Now, autism friendly is, you don't phrase it as a question if it's not a question. If it's a command, well, make sure it sounds like a command. You help me now. And if you insist, you can still say please at the end of the sentence. <laughs> if you insist on being friendly. You know, ju just one more example um, to end with. Um, we have volunteers at our center. We have a bi-monthly magazine. Uh, so every two months we send out for the moment still, 2,500, 3,000 copies of our magazine. Um, that, that, that sending activity is being done by volunteers. Some of them have autism, some don't. Now, one of our volunteers with autism, um, he carries all these boxes with, uh, with the magazines from the first floor to um, the ground floor. And uh, the first couple of times he came, every time he asked, can I carry boxes with the magazine next week too? Um, so we now say, okay, he can carry the boxes because that's probably what he loves to do. He asked for it. Last week he told us, said, I think I'm going to stop my volunteer work here. And we were surprised. We asked him, why? I don't think you give me the right jobs. I'm the only one who has to carry boxes. <laughs> and I hate it. <laughs> he said, but you, you have been asking for it all the time, from the beginning. Why did you ask if you could carry a box? He said, all I wanted to know is what am I going to do next week? Am I going to carry boxes again? So his question was not a question of I like to do this, give it to me, but asking for predictability. And again, I know this man already for so many years. Then I say, Jesus, Peter, you're supposed to be the expert. You should have known. 
that when people with autism ask you a question, you first have to think about predictability and clarity. What they want you to do is to give them predictability and clarity. So often the question behind the question is, tell me what's going to happen with me. You see, so even I make the mistakes and therefore I say the basics is autism friendliness. It's all about clarity and predictability. And often when I enter group homes and schools, people say, yeah, but we know that, Peter. You're all the time nagging about your autism friendliness. We already do that until we start looking together at the very concrete ways of working with people with autism. And then often, even at our center, I see we can still improve a lot. And all the rest comes later. Now, all the rest, I mean, these are the four strategies that I will describe in my workshop after the break. Is it within the five minutes, Glenn? <laughs> I'll feel this one. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, John. <laughs> yes, it, uh, thank you.